Hey folks, General Manager Tony Mizuko coming to you with our weekly Facebook Live update. And we're gonna go through some COVID updates today as well as some storm and other updates. And as always, we will take your questions in the comments. Uh, we had a real relatively short update on COVID last week. So I've got some data I wanna share with everyone and some information. So we're gonna go ahead and get started in just a minute. If you're watching, uh, we always appreciate if a few folks uh, make comments in the comment section to let me know that you're here and that the sound and the audio are working. And we're gonna go ahead and get started with our COVID updates in just a minute. And we're going to share some interesting facts and figures about COVID as well as some updates in the ever-changing world of COVID-19 and its impact on the community. And then, of course, we'll review some of the storm damage information as well. So the first update I'll give on COVID as people are jumping in and joining us is, uh, hi there, folks. Thanks for joining us. On the community testing program, uh, somebody had asked last week, the testing program is on hold. Hey folks, thanks for joining. Thanks for letting me know that the live feed is working. If you've ever done a Facebook Live before, you see yourself in the corner and then you hear nothing. So if the comment feed isn't there, it's hard to know that um, stuff are working. And I'm separated between a wall between my assistant who's helping me, which is normally Joe Collins in our office. But this week I do want to give a special shout out to Xavier Cullen, one of our interns who is helping us on a lot of areas, including with this week's uh, live. So kudos to Xavier for helping us out, who last summer politely reminded me that Facebook is a uh, 35 plus marketing tool, which made me consider my own mortality as such, but um, we appreciate his help this week on uh, our live. So uh, the community testing program is a reminder uh, that we have is temporarily suspended at Norwood Hospital because the hospital is down. We're not sure when we can get that up and running again. However, urgent care in Norwood is doing a lot of testing and I believe they have both serology tests, which is uh, the antibody test, although we don't always recommend those, we don't not recommend them. Uh, and they can do a PCR test. So it's best to call them or call your primary care doctor. It's my understanding they are doing the uh, tests you need for out of state. There is a little bit of a backlog uh, for those of you traveling to Maine, but they should be able to help you out. If you are in need of a test and you're having trouble getting one through your doctor or through a local vendor, you can always call the public health department and uh, they'll see if they'll be able to help you out with that. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about our numbers on COVID because it's pretty interesting. Uh, there's a couple of figures I want to share, and I'm going to share this image here. So it's a little hard to see the graph, but on one side of your screen, you'll see the number 251. I'll make that nice and big. And then up over here, you see the number 13. Now, our total case count right now for confirmed cases is 580. The actual number is a little bit higher than that, and I want to explain that to make sure we understand what confirmed and probable cases are. So a confirmed case is somebody who had what we call a PCR test or actually had the nasal swab and tested positive for COVID-19. Probable cases are one of two things, either A, a serology test, or that's an antibody test. So that's when they test you to see if you have the antibodies, meaning you likely had COVID in the past, or sometimes a doctor's diagnosis where your symptoms match up with it. There's no test and they say, well, we believe it's probable, therefore you're a probable case. So our confirmed cases at 580 are people who have actually been tested for COVID, uh, not just in the town of Norwood, but town of Norwood residents. So that's what we mean when we talk about the probable number. And what's important to note is our number is 580. In the last six weeks, we've had 13 confirmed cases. Going back to the beginning of March when we had our first case and we first began tracking COVID numbers, in the first six weeks, and we're not through this by any means, but in the first six weeks, we had 251 confirmed cases. In the last six weeks, we've had 13 confirmed cases. So overall, that's actually very good news. That means that fewer and fewer people are actually testing positive for COVID. That's a good thing. However, constant vigilance is still important. It's gonna be important now, it's gonna be important next month, it's gonna be important in the fall, and it's gonna be important next year. It's going to be important when there's a vaccine, because I believe one will be coming, and after that. We were discussing with the health department today that things like, first of all, washing hands, we always should have been doing that. That shouldn't have been anything new. I encourage everyone to continue to wash their hands regularly uh, with soap and hot water for 30 seconds. But things like that, maintaining social distance when you can, and of course, wearing masks could have benefits far and beyond just COVID. We could see a great reduction in the flu season, in the transmission of the common cold by doing some of these things long term. So we're in it for the long haul, but as I always tell everyone, wear your masks. I wanna talk about masks in a minute, but we're gonna to continue to talk about our numbers. Our percent positive rate in Norwood 
So that's the percent of people testing positive versus how many people are getting tested is at 1.7% over the last 14 days. Now that's really important because the state average is about 2.2%. So we're actually below the state average in this category, which is good because there have been times we've been ahead of the state average. But what we've seen is the data, more and more data comes out, Norwood's done very well at managing our case count. We have a higher percentage as a overall percent of the population, but in terms of the testing positive numbers, we're doing pretty well in Norwood, 1.7, so less, a smaller percentage of the people in Norwood who are getting tested for COVID have COVID than the state average. We were at one point in time above the state average. As the data got better and more and more testing was done and testing became more widespread, what we actually saw is Norwood is doing better than the state average. To date in Norwood, 4,300 people have been tested for COVID. Now that's a variety of programs, different uh, areas they've been tested in, uh, Norwood Hospital, Urgent Care and other places, but we have exceeded the um, 4,300 mark and we're doing very well with overall testing. We know that may slow a little bit of the hospital closure, but our numbers are very good and that's important. Uh, one update I wanna give as it relates to the serology tests, which are the blood tests that test if you have COVID antibodies. A few weeks ago we reported, and the rules tend to change fairly regularly, that if you got a serology test, you still had to be quarantined. The state has changed the guidance on that. If you get a serology test and it comes back, you're presumed positive, if you've had no symptoms for 14 days, you are allowed to be released into the public, so to speak. So that's a change from whereas before you had to go get a PCR test, which is the nasal swab test. That's the real, your positive test. So what that means is if you get an antibody test, if you've been symptom free for 14 days and you have to be completely symptom free, and you can't lie to the public health nurse because she'll catch you in it, she's very good. So you can't have had a cold eight or nine days ago, but you think you're past it. You can't have had the sniffles 10 days ago, but you think you're past it. You have to actually be symptom free with a serology test and then you won't have to get, um, you, you won't have to go into quarantine for that. Uh, another question we've gotten is people traveling from out of state or going to other states. Now the lovely state of Maine where I lived for several years and worked and has a very special place in my heart, especially because Maine used to be a part of Massachusetts they do want you to have a uh, clear test if you go in there. I do, uh, if you go to Maine, I do know people are going to urgent care and uh, urgent care is not the town hospital and we don't, uh, they're their own private business, but my understanding is folks are going there and they're getting a, um, they're getting a test and that's working when you go to Maine. Uh, we're a little disappointed that Maine's requiring that and other states uh, are not requiring that necessarily uh, in New England, but Maine is being Maine. They're trying to do the best they can do to manage it. I do know one of their concerns in Maine is that a lot of folks in Maine are doing staycations. So where this, they may normally go out of state, they're going to some of their vacation destinations. Now, folks coming back into Massachusetts as of today from out of state, unless you're working out of state, so unless you live on the border and work in Rhode Island, are still supposed to be self-quarantining for 14 days. There really isn't a mechanism by which public health is able to monitor that. So it is a self-quarantine. But you need to look at if you're traveling out of state and you're coming back, what are you doing? What are you doing for your neighbors? What are you doing to contribute to the overall level of public health and the overall slow and stoppage of COVID-19? Now that may change at some point. There may be different guidelines coming out for different states. Um, it's too quick to say, too quick to say, I should say it's too early to say exactly what's gonna happen for folks coming out of state. But if you're traveling out of state, pay attention to the local rules there and pay attention to the rules back here. We do know people are starting to travel. Um, some people are going this month, some people are going in August. I think I may be going away in August myself. So it's sort of a be careful, see what you're doing and see what you need to um, quarantine when you come back. And just remember when you do come back from out of state or if you do go out of state, wear your mask, practice good social distancing when you can and practice good hygiene. And that will help you when you're somewhere else and it'll help you when you come back here. And we of course hope anyone coming to Massachusetts from out of state will practice those, uh, the quarantine to the best of their ability and will continue to practice their good, um, good social hygiene and good social distancing measures. So that's a update on our case count. Again, we uh, had 251 cases the first six weeks. We are at 13 for the last six weeks. I talked about our positive tests and our cases. Uh, I wanna talk about masks for another moment. Masks are required when you enter any restaurant or retail establishment. Um, 
I happen to be somewhere today and somebody didn't have a mask on and they sort of opened the door and said, oh, I forgot my mask, so I need to come in. And it's not my role at all. I happen to just be a customer here. But I yelled out, yes, you do. We don't need any Karens out there. And I think we all know where that term comes from. But you do need a mask. When you're entering a restaurant or retail space, you need to wear a mask. When you sit down at the restaurant and you're ready to eat, you can take your mask off. You need to put it on if you get up and go to the bathroom. You need to put it on if you um, are getting up for some reason, even though you shouldn't be getting up to go to the counter or something, but you, when you get up to leave. I know that's frustrating. I sometimes will walk around town and I like these kind of masks that go, um, somebody last week put the proper comment as to what they're called. Um, it's not a baklava mask, but that's something like that. But these I like because you can throw them up quickly and take them down. It's so important because I want everyone to take a pause and remember where we were just two and a half months ago when nothing was open. We had no outdoor dining, we had no retail open, and we were all sort of stuck at home and waiting for things to begin opening up. We don't want to get back there. The social compliance on the masks is absolutely critical for you, for your neighbors. Gator, that's what they're called. Um, I thought it was a balaclava or something, but I'll take the word gator. But anyway, that social compliance is absolutely critical for us to keep things the way they are and to continue expanding. I mean, we can eat inside in a restaurant now. You can go into Barnes & Noble and buy a book now. You can sit outdoors and eat at a restaurant. These are all good things we want to keep there. Now, I would hope everyone would be concerned. And I think Massachusetts has done incredible overall, and Norwood's done incredible in response to COVID. Think about your neighbors. Think about the community. Think about our country. But if your concern is the economy, you need to think about the economy, too. Because the worst thing for businesses, the worst thing for people's jobs is to have to go back and reshut things down. So any way you want to look at it, if you're concerned about public health, if you're concerned about the community, if you're a good patriot and you care about your country, wear your mask because you're going to protect people's lives. And if you're really worried about the economy and you want things to open back up and you want people to get back to work, wear your mask. So any way you shake it, wear your mask. It's that simple. And I know it's frustrating. Um, I'm going to jump into a couple of municipal updates, but somebody did ask a question about the hospital, um, and I will talk about the hospital now and what they're doing and where they're, um, where they're going. So as everyone knows, the June 28th storm flooded the hospital's basement. What was particularly devastating about that is that the ground floor, the basement level of the hospital is where their electrical and mechanical rooms are. So there was actually never a power loss to the hospital from the power coming in. It's just they lost their electrical room excuse me for slurping there, and that caused major damage to the building, and all of that needs to be replaced before the building will get um, can get up and running again. The Somebody said the rumors that it's been condemned. This is sort of a bureaucratic terminology question. When a building's condemned, it means that that building is unsafe and can usually not come back from being condemned. We don't really condemn buildings in that sense. Um, so the hospital hasn't been condemned. It's not fit for occupancy. And I know that sounds like it's just a change in language, but almost any building that suffers damage where all of your building systems can't work is unfit for habitation or for occupancy. So your own home, let's say your home loses power. And if it's expected to be out for a couple of days, technically your home is not fit for occupancy. It's not fit for habitancy. It doesn't meet the, state's habita the state habitation code or state codes for buildings to be occupied. That doesn't mean it's been condemned. Uh, that just means you're not allowed to operate out of there other than in an emergency situation. So it hasn't been condemned. The building could be repaired and brought back into operation. The hospital is developing a three-phase plan. The first phase is getting the ER up and running, which we're still looking at 45 days. We were hoping it was 30 days was the best case scenario. We're now seeing it's probably 45 to 60 days to get the ER up and running because you need the ER and you need a couple of the little services around the ER to make it work. So a perfect example of that is x-ray. So God forbid somebody breaks their leg and they go to the ER, they need to do an x-ray. So it's not just about opening up the ER and having a bed in there. It's you need to have a couple of these little services right around the ER. So phase one is getting the ER up and running. Phase two moves to sort of getting up and running uh, what I'd call or, or what the hospital would even term in a micro hospital where you have some of the services starting to come back in small numbers. Phase three is the big plan. It's likely that from talking with hospital officials, they're probably going to look at a rebuild of a major portion of the hospital, which would probably start with the LaRusso building. So is it going to get torn down and rebuilt completely? Right now, there's a good chance of that happening. It's not definite, 
there have been no engineering plans, there have been no design plans. That's probably a massive uh, couple hundred million dollar project that would probably take around 36 months. That doesn't mean the hospital is going to be completely offline that time. I mean, there's a lot of process that needs to go through here. But the initial look is the building has suffered a lot of damage. They need to get some of the systems up and running so they can run the Draper building and some of the other functions. But do you invest 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars in gutting and rehabbing a building or do you look to take it down and build something state of the art in the place? And I think they're looking at the investment would make sense to do that. So from start to finish until it's 100% operational and all new, it could be as much as 36 months. But that's because they're taking a look at, uh, picture your garage at home and your garage at home has a lot of damage and you can fix it. At what point do you say, do I put a lot of money into fixing it or do I tear it down and build a better garage? Um, so, and the hospital's not saying that they're gonna stay shut for a couple of years until they build every new building that they're gonna look at doing. It's just taking a step back and evaluating the campus and saying, how do we invest to make this work? So um, that's what they're looking at is a three phase plan where ER first, 60 days um, is the outer time limit for that. Phase two is getting up sort of a micro hospital where more of the services come back and most of their services are back in some form or another. The cath lab we want to come back uh, and other items. And then phase three is, well, what do you do to really, and they'll probably, in some cases, these will all be going on at once. Phase three is what's the future of the hospital? So in terms of the specific damage, it really was that their mechanical room, so the pharmacy was pretty much wiped out. So all the product in the pharmacy was wiped out, but the hospital is planning on relocating the uh, pharmacy anyway. So there's some infrastructure already set up for that. The electrical room and the mechanical room that runs the building, total garbage, complete underwater, needs to be completely done. Some of that work has to get done anyway, just to get the building up and running. And then the courtyard had some flooding where it built up and then that water got into the HVAC system and into the piping system and caused a lot of damage to the first and second floor. So that's why the repairs are pretty substantial. Water can sometimes get into a basement or get into a home and it's there for a little while and it goes out and it doesn't cause a lot of damage and things dry out. The same four inches of water in my basement versus your basement might be no damage but a dehumidifier running for a day or two versus forty or $50,000 worth of damage. So the hospital unfortunately suffered a lot of damage from the water getting into some of their key building systems and then getting into the walls and getting into the building as well. That causes a lot of problems. What officials from Stewart and we, we met, I mean, I talked to the hospital CEO daily, Sal Perla, and uh, we've talked with some of their officials from Dallas, from their corporate headquarters, if you will, they want to invest in Norwood. They want to put a lot of money into the hospital and rebuild parts of the hospital bigger and better than they were before. We think that's a good thing. The hospital in one form or another has been in Norwood for 100 years and we want to keep it in Norwood for the next 100 years in a newer state-of-the-art facility is the best thing for the community and it's the best thing for the hospital. It's going to take time to get there. Luckily, Stewart has done this before. We're going to walk with them step by step. Uh, we've already talked about having our Economic Development Commission work with them in the state to see what incentives can be granted, what project process we can help with to move them along. We may look at zoning changes because we want a high functioning, high efficiency, quality, high quality hospital right here in town. I mean, beyond the economics of the 1,400 jobs at the hospital, which will take time to come back, and beyond that they're a large taxpayer and they're a large water and sewer and electric customer and all that impacts every service the town provides, there's a lot of the secondary services where they're a buyer of a lot of services in town which supports our businesses. All of the people who live in town and work at the hospital as well as all the people who don't live in town and work in the hospital and all of the services they're purchasing from restaurants and gas stations and stores, all of that purchasing power in the economy, we want that to come back at where it was and then be better than where it was to continue growing uh, the economy locally and to continue that money going in there. So. To summarize on the hospital, a lot of damage to the building. The key systems were, uh, the electrical and mechanical systems were damaged. The ER is probably, uh, I'm optimistic, I'd say 45 days, could be as long as 60. Uh, still could be within that 30 to 45 days. Uh, phase two, which we will start after that, is starting to get the, um, some of the sort of a micro hospitals, the concept up and running, where you start bringing on uh, bits of the hospital here and there. And then phase three is looking at the future of the hospital. And it's not just looking at it, but it's planning for it, which will likely be a major reconstruction of some parts of the hospital. The LaRusso building is being, um, they've talked about that as possibly being a complete tear down and rebuild. And part of that's practical from once you've suffered something like this, you look at doing what you can do to make sure it doesn't happen again. So we look at it as an investment. If they're willing to invest a couple hundred million dollars in the hospital, that's a good thing.
and we welcome it and we're going to work with them and be their lockstep. The hospital's been in town for 100 years. It's not going to go anywhere. We're going to do everything we can do, not just to have it come back to full strength, but have it come back bigger and better than it was before. And that benefits everyone in town and the economy and the municipality as well. So, Kate, I hope that answers your questions. Um, I did have you here to talk about the hospital. Um, yeah, I talked about the phases in the plan. So that's where we are with Norwood Hospital, and we're looking forward to them coming back better than ever. But it will still be probably 45 to 60 days before the ER and then going from there. I mean, one thing to remember is they're a business, and anytime any business's doors are closed, they're not able to make money. So there's no incentive for them to drag their feet in getting everything back up and running at the hospital because the minute they get sections open, they're able to go ahead and get money again, as well as serve people, which is our primary function and take care of the community. But like any business, if their doors aren't open, they're not making money, or at least most businesses. I'm sure there's some businesses out there that are, uh, you know, if you own stocks or something like that, if you're in the market. But um, we're looking to uh, get that done, uh, get them up and running, and we're going to work with them hand step and work with the state and the federal government to get them uh, whatever support they need to get them up and running. Uh, question from Sandra about uh, the library and when they will open. We're targeting early August for the library. Um, they're doing their uh, pop-up libraries at the elementary schools, and they're doing their curbside. They're serving between 60 and 70 people a day with curbside, which is fantastic. They're doing great with that. And of course, Hoopla, our digital system, is up and running. But we're hoping to have the beginning of August, the library physically open. The one challenge we're really looking at, we've we've kind of got the physical distancing ready. We've kind of got the staff in place. We've kind of got the PPE in place and the staff are itching to get people out. We're a little worried that we're trying to see if other libraries can come out and let us know when they're going to open up because we don't want to open our library up. And then other libraries are looking a week or two or three weeks down the road after that. And then we sort of get a deluge of people coming in to the Norwood Library from other communities because they're not open yet. So we're trying to work regionally and see if we can get a few other towns to say, okay, first week of August is when most of us want to open up, at least in our network, the Minuteman network, so we can start getting people back in the library. But we don't want Norwood to be overwhelmed uh, with other people coming in. Yes, Sarah, we specifically asked people to ask about the library so you wouldn't be the first one asking about it. But they're, the staff there are itching to get back and to get you in. We just, we're just about ready. We think we've got the plans ready to go. We just want to see if we can get a couple other neighboring communities to jump on board and um, open it around the same time so we just don't get overwhelmed with too many people coming in. Uh, and Kate uh, Teague Pop, uh, talking about the Pop-Up Kids Library will be Thursday at the Prescott from 10 to 1. Bring your card and mask. I believe this week, Kate, it was at the Balch, but I, uh, I saw it online. But uh, it was a great program where you're able to go and have a pop-up library. So um, we think that's really cool. It's a really creative program. Um, credits Norwood Library for that. But they're looking to get up and running uh, soon. Um, Beth, we'll go into uh, the updates on damage to the home in just a moment. Uh, just one quick point. The Civic Center is going to slowly start opening next week. Um, Sarah, please do start pressuring other towns. If they, they could just announce the same date, if we can get half a dozen towns to do it, we'd be feel more comfortable going forward with it. Uh, the Civic Workout Room is going to start opening the middle of next week. Information will be come, uh, coming up about that um, soon. It's going to be a reservation-only system because the guidance for when you're in a gym-type environment is either barriers, which we can't really accommodate, or 14 feet if people are using equipment. So we can only limit the work room to about five or six people at a time, the workout room. So it'll be on a uh, schedule basis, on a sort of a reservation basis. The rec department should have details out on that soon. So that'll really be for some of the hardcore workout users. Um, I keep hoping my gym will be closed a little bit longer. Uh, so I have more of an excuse not to go back. But at some point, I'm sure they will open. And um, you know, Leanne, I'm not sure if the hospital lost all of their PPE. I'm sure quite a bit of it will be uh, was salvaged. Um, although what they have left, I'm sure they're shipping out to other hospitals since quite a bit of it won't be used uh, for at least 30 to 45 days. And they'll, I know they did lose a lot of their, their pharmacy. Um, so that will take them some time to get those orders in and up. Uh, and some senior center programs are going to start opening in the next week or two very, very slowly. Um, we are getting a lot done at the senior center. So we want to wait for that to get done. But that, I believe, is starting work. Uh, they may have actually started work today. I was told Thursday, and it is Thursday. I haven't driven by there today. Uh, Beth's question is, what about residents with major damage to our homes? What's the update from the town? So we have a half a million dollars in our local grant program. Uh, we're looking at other funding sources. I'll be honest with you, I don't know if we're going to get any relief from the state or the federal government. Uh, we're certainly trying, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, answer to that question ends up being zero dollars, but the state hasn't concluded their budget process for the year, so it's possible that hope will come through. 
if you've sent us an email, what we need you to do is go ahead and fill out the grant form. So there's a link right on our website and we'll, um, we'll get it posted in there. If you haven't filled out the grant, if you have damage, um, the application is fairly straightforward. There's some information we need and some documents we need to upload because there's sort of a, I wouldn't call it a complex, but a fairly detailed process we have to go through for the verification. We believe we're going to start site visits, if not this weekend, because it may rain on Saturday. Uh, we will start um, Monday with site visits. We have to visit each site. We've actually started informally some of them that had heavy damage this week. Uh, Mr. Cooper and I were out at a few of them assessing the damage and sort of working through our grant program. So we have a lot of information we got to get. We have to do a site visit and then we have to start. We want to start getting funds out to assist people. It is a reimbursable grant. So most folks have to expend the money before we can reimburse them unless they're very low income. But all of that goes through a process of checking. We have to do our, our due diligence. It is taxpayer money for it. But if you have not applied yet, please go on and apply. We have uh, probably three or four staff directly working and reviewing all the applications, including, including Bernie Cooper and myself. And then we'll have a team of about a dozen or 15 people who will be going out and doing site visits, different town employees, not all at once. You'll, you'll get a visit from a team of two. And the complexity of the application determines how much, you know, how much information we need and how simple it is. But we want to start getting aid out to people as soon as we can. So if you've put in your application, you will hear from us. And we'll be starting site visits next week. And the hope is within two weeks of a site visit, we can get some aid out. We are working with some agencies to help some folks who needed assistance with muckouts in their basements um, where they didn't necessarily have the resources on their own. Uh, some folks were able to go ahead and do that. Some folks still haven't cleaned out their basements yet. And that's a challenge as well. So um, if you have not applied for the grant yet, please put it in. The closing date is July 20th. We don't know what we'll be able to accept after that because we do know we're going to get more requests than there is funding. But the more we have the information, the more we can start that process and move things along uh, with the grant application. Uh, Balch had over 75 folks today, which is fantastic. A uh, quick question from Deborah uh, is, are masks required while exercising at the Civic? The answer is yes, they are. Uh, so please wear your mask if you go there. Uh, and uh, we posted the application there for the grant progression, pro, uh, program. Uh, comment from Layla, uh, please, we still have COVID-19 in Norwood. Yes, we have COVID-19 in all 351 towns in Massachusetts and all 50 states. So hand washing, mask wearing, practicing social distancing when you can is important. Please continue to do so. Uh, question from uh, Matt, uh, what do you think, or why do you think the state won't help at all? Um, so to Beth's point, yes, it's still a $5,000 cap. The reason being that if we if we didn't have that cap, that's to try to spread the money out and help as many people as we can. If we lifted that, we would help we, there's probably 15 people we could help and that was it. Uh, as for why won't the state have is a budget thing or a dollar threshold to qualify. So it's a combination of both. The state, unless there's a major disaster, doesn't want to step in because their concern is always that what happens when other towns have a problem and are the state is the state always responsible for stepping in. Uh, usually FEMA looks at a couple million dollar dollar threshold. With the hospital alone, we've well exceeded that. FEMA is under a lot of pressure as a result of COVID that their um, FEMA was never designed to handle a disaster everywhere in the nation at once. The state is going to always be concerned about giving money to one community because then the next community is going to say, well, we have a disaster. So where are we getting money? I think our situation is unique here coming on COVID plus the loss of the hospital plus a couple million dollars in residential damage. I think it's substantial. And unfortunately, it was one of these sort of uh, it wasn't exactly a microburst, but it was really concentrated to just the town of Norwood. Um, our dollar threshold, if you want to count the hospital, can meet whatever threshold they need. It's just people tend to be tight with their budgets and they're worried about when they help here, they help, can't help over here, which is why the buck might ultimately be on Norwood. Uh, the state will conclude their budget process before the end of June. It's possible that our delegation could get something in there that would provide assistance. But right now they're trying to work with us. But at the end of the day, it's dollars that we need to add to our grant funding uh, local funding. It is incredibly rare that a city or town will have local funding available for anything like this. So it's rare that a city or town is stepping forward, but we certainly realize, uh, having lived through it, how much damage there is in the community and what the impact is and how many homes did have thirty and forty thousand dollars worth of damage. Some people lucked out and they had, you know, an eight hundred dollar heater repair, but there's a lot of homes with thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of damage and that uh, goes to Beth's point about if five thousand dollars is the cap. If we raise that cap, there's some people who we would only hit, help ten or fifteen people. So we're trying to take the sting out of it. 
as we get through applications, if there's funding left, there may be a possibility to go ahead and review that. Some people only had $800 worth of damage, but some people had forty dollars or $50,000 worth of damage. We want to spread the money out as much as we can to reasonably help as many people as we can with, the pro uh, with, with their storm relief. But get your grant application in. Um, if you've lost a lot of personal belongings, I know the Red Cross does have some assistance available, but we're focusing on the habitability of the home. We are looking at to try to identify additional funding for um, appliance repair and replacement. We're working with uh, NGRID to try to see what else they can come up with, and we're trying to see if there's something else we can work with the Department of Energy Resources on, um, but that's a little bit uh, challenging. Um, so we're, uh, we're working, we're trying to help everyone that we can. The pinned comment there is the flood grant program. Apply, even if you're not sure you meet, if you're in the, the higher income category or we've told businesses, go ahead and put it in. If uh, it, it doesn't hurt to try, but if you haven't gotten your application in, please get it in. We may be on our own for this one, but Norwood's always taking care of its own and we'll continue to work on ways to um, help folks as we work through the grant program. Those of you who have applied, you may get a call or an email from the office. Um, other than the grant application, we're never going to, uh, in the event that anyone were to try to scam you, we'll never ask for any financial information. It's you apply for the grant program and um, we may call and ask you a question, but we'll never ask you for your social or anything like that online. You may get an email or a phone call from one of the grant staff. And then when you get a site visit uh, in a few weeks, we'll, within the next few weeks, we'll call you ahead of time and they'll be town staff and they'll identify themselves as town staff. Uh, if you have not submitted, submit. Uh, the team has started reviewing them. Visits will be coming soon, and we're aware of how much damage uh, there is out there in the community. And it's not um, more funding would help, but we're there to uh, we're we're the, there to help. If you haven't gotten your basement cleaned out yet, and you still have water damage, you can always let us know. You can always send us updates, but just go ahead and apply, put, fill in the grant application. Um, Mr. Cooper and I visited a couple of sites yesterday. One of them was an elderly individual who. Um, is disabled and couldn't even get in her basement to clean it if she needed to. We're finding resources to help her out. There was another person who lost sort of the lower floor of their home and uh, we actually pulled up a couple floorboards and they were still visibly wet on the underside. So uh, there's there's a lot of damage out there and um, we were able to get some dehumidifiers. We're ordering more as part of the, uh, the process to help folks. So go ahead and put in your application. We're gonna try to find a way to help everyone. There's different means, there's different pockets. It may not be much, but every little bit um, helps and we're going to be talking to some other corporate partners as well to see what they can add uh, to the process. Uh, question from uh, Devin, uh, when is Norwood Day? Norwood Day has officially been uh, postponed for this year. We may do something in September to make up for it, but the committee felt that given A, the challenges of fundraising and B, um, large events like that still not necessarily being allowed under the health rules, that Norwood, would, um, Norwood Day wouldn't be a uh, an option this year. We're still, we may try to do fireworks. We may try to do a Norwood, I don't know, a Norwood night, something like that to try to have some sort of an event in place of, or in lieu of Norwood day, but we're not sure um, what exactly is going to take place, but something will. And uh, Matt, we certainly appreciate residents helping us out. And we know you've contacted state officials. That always helps. Sometimes they can't, um, sometimes they can't do anything. They've been working with us. I've been speak, spoken to the Lieutenant Governor a couple of times. Um, you can always send in emails and calls and tweets to the governor and the LG, thank them for what they're doing and just continue to ask them for more help. As well as our delegation, we know that Senator Rush and Representative Rogers um, have been in contact with the governor's office. We are one town in 351, but it never hurts. Um, I think it was Amanda who had said somewhere that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and that's true, the squeaky wheel does get the grease. Um, just be polite and be professional and continue to request assistance. If we have to bear this on our own shoulders, we certainly will, but any assistance will be helpful. I know Congressman Lynch was out here uh, just earlier this week. The weeks all seem to merge together, and we're certainly grateful for his assistance. But at the end of the day, um, thoughts and prayers are important, but we do need dollars to help people recover. And uh, we do have information we can get out there. We talked about last week from the state's insurance commissioner. If your insurance company is giving you a hard time and not coming out and issuing you a denial or sending an adjuster out, but that won't change the fact that if a policy doesn't cover something and they're not providing resources, they're not providing resources but we're going to look to see to continue to help everyone. We've received, uh, in terms of emails to the office with reports of damage, the number is over 300. Uh, and again, those range from um, some folks had a little drain that fell off and it's a $50 repair. Some people had an $800 furnace repair. Some people had $50,000 worth of damage um, to their home. One or two cases above that. 
we're starting to get reports of business damage in. We know that there's a fair number of businesses that did suffer damage. We don't know if we'll have funding down the road um, for them, but we've asked them to go ahead and apply to as a tier three. And if there is funding left as we go through things, and sometimes it's the game of cobbling funding together. What can churches do? What can corporations do? What can our funding do? And how do we make it work um, with some of uh, the damage? But the challenge is, is you know, if a five thousand dollar furnace goes, it, it's a furnace. There's no, um, you know, there's not necessarily not a way to um, get that taken care of other than replacing it. But we are working with it. A couple of the local appliance vendors have been great to work with so far. Um, Poirers and Sams on. I'm um, helping us with our internal process so we can get things expedited for folks as well. The um, DPW continues to address stormwater issues throughout the town and drainage issues throughout the town. We know we're getting calls in uh, from folks, so we're trying to be proactive. I did mention last week that 4.6 inches of rain in under an hour and a half, there's no stormwater system in the world that could ever handle that. So we're, um, we'll always continue to look at our system and make adjustments where we can. There's no system in the world that could help that. We do know there's rain coming this weekend. It doesn't look like it's going to be too severe over Norwood, but these projections change every day. We can handle a good system over a long-term period. That huge, and that high intensity rating, uh, that, that high intensity rain, that's where it's really tough for any system to handle. But we'll be uh, on, on call and on patrol this weekend as well to try to mitigate damage. I'll talk for just a minute about the um, teams of site reviewers that are coming out for all the applications. It's um, volunteers from town staff and there, um, yes, Nina, thank you. The, the Heritage Baptist Church did have around a half a million dollars worth of damage. We actually spoke with a group from the Carolinas that wanted to come up um, and help them out, and they were worried about the travel restrictions and the health department to um, let them know that we would find a way to work with them on that. Uh, but if you do know one at the Heritage Baptist Church, they were damaged uh, pretty severely in uh, as a result of the storm. Uh, the site reviewers are going to be town staff who go through a training process, and they're really there to just talk with you to put a face to a name, to see the damage. Some of you will have already cleaned up or repaired what the damage is, but it's just part of our process. We're there to talk to everyone, to see every see the damage, and to take a um, take some photos. They're not inspectors. We may need to send an inspector out and we'll talk with you if there's something we need to verify that it's actually damaged, but they're really just applicant reviewers. They're there to talk with you, to work with you, to see what your other needs are, to see how you're doing and take pictures. They'll start coming out in the next, um, uh, in the next uh, a couple of weeks, maybe as soon as Sunday, Monday. Uh, Kate asked a question, will the Winter Street Recycling Facility have extra days that are open and still doing cleanup uh, like last week? Uh, we're not doing additional days, but this Saturday we will have dumpsters there for storm cleanup. Uh, we were fairly successful last week uh, with the extra days that we opened. We had about 80 people one day, about 70 people the other day, and about 400 people on Saturday. So we will have dumpsters there this Saturday for storm debris only, uh, as, as regular as the, the regular recycling facility stuff, um, functions over there as well. So you can bring storm debris there this Saturday if you're a Norwood resident. Um, you need a dump sticker, recycling facility sticker. It's not a dump anymore. It's a closed landfill. Uh, recycling sticker or bring your Norwood light bill if it's storm damage. We'll do that again uh, for this weekend. And then we may have the dumpsters there um, the following weekend. We'll see what the volume is this weekend. We know we, we had probably... Uh, 250 people on Saturday alone with storm debris uh, bringing it up. So you can continue to do that if you have a um, storm debris this Saturday. And then we'll look at whether we'll do it uh, the following Saturday. We wanted to particularly give people an extra chance this past Thursday and Friday, uh, especially with a lot of folks being home for the holiday, to be able to um, get their stuff out. But we served several hundred uh, customers just for storm damage this past week and uh, we'll do it again this Saturday and then we'll evaluate from there if we're absolutely jammed up on Saturday we'll be able to add more days if we need to but that's a uh, that's a great question Kate I'm gonna go ahead and give that one a like um, with that I think I've run through most of my updates but I'm sure folks have COVID related questions and storm related questions and hospital related questions so I can review some of what I've gone over but you can always ask us questions in the comments as well just briefly jumping back to COVID, our testing program is on hold. You should call Urgent Care if you need a test. Um, our program being on hold until the hospital is up and running. The serology tests, which are the antibody tests, if you come back positive with a serology test, you, if you've had no symptoms for 14 days, public health will not make you need to quarantine. That's a change from where we were a few weeks ago, but the state changes those regulations. Our positive test rate is 1.7% in Norwood. It's higher in the state level, which is good. Uh, well, that's not good. We don't want it to be good, but we're happy to be ahead of the curve there. 
we've had 13 cases in the last six weeks. The first six weeks, we had 251. So Norwood, you were doing great, and Massachusetts is doing great. We hope the rest of the country doesn't screw this up for us. Uh, but we're doing great, so keep, uh, keep distancing when you can. Wash your hands. You should wash your hands anyway, even if there's no pandemic. Uh, and continue to wear your masks as much as possible when you go in and out of uh, facilities and when you're in uh, retail areas, continue to do that. Uh, the Civic Workout Room will beginning, begin opening next week. Uh, it's going to be a reg reservation basis. Uh, the Some Senior Center functions are going to be opening in the next week. we got to get the lot done there. Uh, the library, we're targeting early August. We're feeling good. And... Um, the uh, Civic Library and non-COVID, again, our grant program, if you have not submitted to our grant program, please submit to our grant program. We're going to do everything we can do to help every resident. We're here for you. Uh, we may be on our own on this one, but we'll, we'll, make, we'll make sure to take care of our community one way or another. Um, and we know that next week we're going to start team reviews of your sites. We've already received, uh, as of today, about 60 applications out of the 300 inquiries we've gotten. So we know that there's a lot more applications coming in and we have a team reviewing them and working on them. So please continue to send in your application if you have. If you're not sure if you qualify, but you had some damage, it's okay to send an application in. It doesn't mean you're gonna get anything. Uh, we may not have funds available, it may not qualify, but it doesn't hurt to send it in. Uh, we just put them at the sort of the tier three category, but you never know, it doesn't hurt uh, It doesn't hurt as we get more and more damage in. We, As I said, we have a problem between some people had several hundred dollars worth of damage, some people had forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of damage. If anyone is without, uh, nobody should be without power, uh, although sometimes our system may not detect a local meter, but if you are without power or your furnace is not working or your hot water heater is currently not working, you can always email us specifically with something like that. We may have other resources to expedite something uh, directly like that as well. And then I talked about the hospital. The ER update is we're probably looking at 45 to 60 days for the ER to be up and running. Um, they have to get some of the services right around the ER to make that work. And then phase two will sort of be creating a micro hospital where they start bringing more and more services online. And phase three is really the big plan where they're looking at some major construction at the hospital, uh, probably or possibly replacing the entire LaRusso building with a brand new building. And there may be an, a complete reconfiguration of the campus as Stewart's looking to invest in the hospital, which we think is great for the community, for the jobs in the community, the economic impact, the purchasing power, and the health impact of having the hospital right here in town. It's one of those things where you Sometimes people would knock it and we don't always know, uh, we don't always, aren't always as grateful for it until you lose it all of a sudden and then you're saying, gee, I wish it was just right down the road. I know I certainly feel, uh, I've gone to Norwood Hospital a couple times myself, I've gotten great treatment there and I certainly feel uh, comfortable having it here in the community and we're looking forward to them coming back better and stronger than before. Uh, so that's a recap of my updates. I'll uh, take questions and I'll just show my handy little chart here. Over on this side, you'll notice our first six weeks, we had 251 cases. Our last six weeks, 13 cases. So please continue wearing your mask. Maybe I'll even wear my mask for the next couple of minutes, uh, although it may not look great in the video at the end. Uh, so folks, any questions you have, you can ask in the comments. I'll scroll up here and see if I've missed any. Uh, let me scroll from the beginning. I tend to miss them. Hi, everyone that said hello. Uh, it is definitely very hot today. Uh, funny story, the air conditioning in my office has never really worked correctly, and I've complained about it for a couple of years. And facilities has always sort of said, yeah, well, I don't know, we can't, can't trace the source of it, and we can't figure out exactly what the uh, issue is. And then um, we had the cooling tower fail at Town Hall, and we replaced it. And now the air conditioning in my office works wonderfully, and it's um, unfortunately a little cold in my office. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, we appreciate giving more information about COVID. It is here for a while. Um, uh, question around COVID. Uh, the porta potties in the town are allowed, but I was told that ones for the Little League field are not allowed. It seems like they're uh, one and the same, uh, good for the public, as long as there are plenty of sanitizer. Um, I would have to check about the Little League field. It may be that we typically, and I don't know this for sure, we typically don't place them out there, but I will look into that. One of the things I'd like to do next year as a community preservation project is there's these, uh, they're not portable toilets, they're self-composting toilets called um, uh, squeaky wheel gets the oil, not the grease. Uh, it, there's these self-composting toilets called uh, clivus units. I actually, apparently they're called clevis or something else, but I mispronounced them. We used to use them out in Western Mass. And you basically install it somewhere and it's a seasonal, so probably April to October, um, sort of self-composting toilet. I'd like to talk with the selectmen, the park commissioners and the CPA committee about installing them in all of our parks so that way seasonally we have a restroom facility at almost all of our parks 
that would solve a lot of those issues. Um, and we would, um, uh, let me make a look. And it would um, give us access to bathroom facilities at more of our parks for most of the year just to make it a little bit more comfortable. It'd be a great, great initiative. But we'll look at the, um, the Little League. It may be a, it could possibly be a cost issue. Um, if we were to try to place them out at eight or ten different parks, it may become prohibitive. Then that's why we would want to do the call uh, the um, the Clivus units. But I will look into specifically about the Little League field and where um, what the history is between them not being allowed. Uh, and the squeaky wheel does get the grease. It never hurts to never hurts to ask questions. Uh, and same thing with our grant program. It never hurts to try. Um, Devin, uh, thank you. Hi Lisa. Hi Eileen. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, other questions that folks have in the comments about COVID or uh, the hospital or town business or the budget or, you know, OPEB, which is always one of my favorite topics. Uh, you can probably save that for another day. But uh, if folks have other questions or comments, uh, anything they'd like to bring up to us, we're committed to continuing to bring these Facebook Lives every week. We found them to be a good way to communicate. A lot of people have gone back and um, watched them. And Dr. Thompson does school updates on Tuesdays. I like to think that Dr. Thompson copied my idea, but uh, he and I go back and forth. Uh, over who came up with the idea first and we're still looking at trying to do a joint one at some point um, uh, yeah Amanda send me an email and I'll look into that um, I'm just wondering if there's some blanket rule about it somewhere that we didn't want any group just doing it here or there but I off the top of my head I don't really I don't know why not and I would think that the public health department would actually be supportive of um, any ways you can add facilities and there's ways to have them dropped off. We actually, just so everyone knows, the two porta potties on Central Street are cleaned twice a week. Uh, so they're cleaned and restocked twice a week. Uh, Lisa, we talked a little bit earlier about the hospital. Um, it's, it's looking a little rough. It's going to be about 60 days for the ER to get up and running. And uh, thank you, Courtney. I think he copied me too, but that's all right. We love him, so it's okay. Uh, about 60 days for the ER to get up and running, and then they're going to slowly start bringing on other services. So they at least have a small portion of most of the services they had before. And some of them they may bring in, you know, temporary trailers to have this office here, or that office there. And then they're looking at um, possibly rebuilding certain portions of the hospital. They may look at a total rebuild of the LaRusso wing. That's been talked about. It could happen. It may not. That would take a long time. So we're probably looking at a long period of time before everything is completely back to normal. But the priority is getting that ER back up and running. Once that's there, they can work on getting other services back up and running uh, on the hospital, at the hospital. So it'll be in it for the long slog, but we're going to work with the hospital. We're going to see what assistance we can get them from the federal and state government in terms of helping them uh, rebuild, whether we can get uh, low interest loans or tax financing or uh, zoning changes or what, what we can do to keep our hospital here that's been here for 100 years here to keep it vibrant, to really turn it into a world class a health center, which is, I think, what we need and deserve. It's a huge economic imp uh, engine for the town. It's a huge revenue engine for the town. And there's about 1,400 employees uh, at the hospital. I know Stewart's trying to find places for them, but we know that there's going to be some job loss as a result of it. And we have um, Mass Hire working to help folks on that. And we have means available to help folks in the short term who face some job loss for the hospital. So as, as always in Norwood, we're committed to helping everyone and doing everything we can do uh, for our community and especially for our hospital. It doesn't matter who owns it or who runs it. It's our hospital. It's been in Norway for 100 years. And I think we need to look forward to what we're going to do to have the hospital here for the next 100 years and be willing to, to do that and help them out so that way the hospital is here for the next 100 years. And I think growth of the hospital is great. It's great revenue for the town. It's great jobs. It's a safety fashion. If there's those of us who live in Norwood and I live in Norwood, we often say that we don't really have to leave town for anything. And with the hospital, you don't. And the more services they can offer, the better they are, even less of a reason to have to uh, drive outside of Norwood. Uh, other questions from folks. As always, you can email us at managers at norwoodma.gov. If you have not put in for a flood grant program, please go ahead and put in for a flood grant program. If you're having problems with the flood grant, uh, with flood damage, again, let us know. Put in for the grant. If you need immediate assistance, let us know. We're here to help. Uh, we're at about the 50 minute mark. If folks have questions, they can continue to send them in. Otherwise, we can look towards um, logging off. I'm going to type in our email address here. Gov. Uh, how old is the LaRusso building? Uh, that's actually a great question. I believe it was built in the early 80s, and the original plan had uh, two floors on top of it, uh, two more floors than it is. One was shaved off due to some, uh, I think, public opposition, and then they cut another floor off uh, out of the plan because the interest rate climate at the time is that the interest rates were so high, the financing was just too expensive. So that building was originally to plan to be 
uh, one, originally two stories, and then one story taller than it was, uh, and then it got cut down to what it currently is. So I know if they did have a bigger building, whether that's wider or taller, they'd probably be able to go to all private rooms, which is apparently the uh, good standard for hospitals to have. Um, luckily, I haven't been in hospitals too much. Um, I don't know if I've ever had a private room, but uh, I think I had a private ER room once when I had a kidney stone, but that's about it. So uh, it's about 35 years old and uh, was originally planned to be much bigger. So there comes a point where do you spend all that money in rebuilding the building or do you build something that might be bigger and better? And, then, and we know we have a great cath lab here. Um, we're sort of the number one place where somebody having a heart problem comes within a, a large area. So maybe they bring on other functions like that to make it more of a regional center. And one point uh, to mention about the hospital for anyone uh, who doesn't know, there's about a dozen communities in what we call a hospital's catchment area. So that's the area that it serves. So there's a dozen ambulance services or more that bring patients to Norwood Hospital. So we rely on the hospital here in town, but a quarter of a million people in our region rely on that hospital for their emergency services. So it's a big loss to the region. It's not just a Norwood loss. It's a big loss to the region. Uh, that being said, you can always email us at managed at norwoodma.gov. Um, if there's no further questions, we're going to go ahead and log off. I hope everyone stays safe. Uh, be Remember to help your neighbors. Continue to wear your mask. If you haven't applied for our grant program, apply for our grant program. And as always, email us at managers at norwoodma.gov if you have any questions or problems or concerns, and we will work on helping you. So thank you, everyone. And Amanda, we're going to do some research and get back to you on your question about uh, the porta potties. So thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the evening. And we'll, uh, we'll end the video in just a minute here. Take care, folks.